This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, where we help women remove the overwhelm of living their most holistic life. This is the place to find evidence-based nutrition tactics, healthy lifestyle and wellness tips, abundance mindset, and easily implementable low-tox living strategies so you can rise up to your full potential and protect your family's health. I'm your host, Stacey Heine certified holistic nutritionist and better living advocate. Now let's get empowered with some simple swaps that make a big impact for optimal wellness. Welcome back. It's episode 42 of the Urban Pharmacy Podcast. And today's guest is my amazing and incredible friend, Dr. Stefan Esser. He is a sports and lifestyle medicine physician and fourth generation plant-based eater. He is an advocate for educating and motivating patients to achieve their best health through personal lifestyle changes, which I think we all know how important that is, right? He completed medical school at the University of South Florida residency at Harvard and sports fellowship at Mayo Clinic. And he runs a busy sports medicine practice, incorporating nutrition, standard care, and cutting edge stem cell and growth factor injections. He is team physician for the University of North Florida varsity athletics, faculty member of two medical residencies and fellowships. He is somewhat of a busy guy. In addition, he and his wife host people in Healthy Living Juice Bungalow for those needing a retreat from the VP world to renew. I mean, hello, Stefan is incredible. Seriously, if you want to learn about natural health and lifestyle approaches to having a strong immune system, that is what we talk about today. And I really, really hope that you find value in today's episode. Uh, Stefan has been doing, you know, and living this way for his entire life. And um, he really just spreads light and information and education across every single person's vibe that he comes across. And I think that you're going to get that when you hear this episode. So cheers to episode 42, and I will see you on the other side. Here it is. Dr. Stefan Esser. Welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, my friend. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Super, super excited to have you on this morning. I usually start the conversation off with an icebreaker, and we're going to do that right now. It's 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I don't know if you've eaten or not. I have. I do the early morning eating. That's my way of living. What's your favorite food right now, currently in this day in life? What's your current favorite food? Pineapple. (laughs) Hands down. I'm in love with pineapples these days. It's literally like right there in front of your camera. I I brought it just in case we were going to talk about food. (laughs) That is so funny. And I actually think that maybe you've done an Instagram filter with a pineapple. I know you've done a banana and a potato, which have been absolutely (laughs) hilarious. And they are so, Uh, just so funny. Um, But pineapples are amazing too. Oh gosh, there's so many. So many, many amazing benefits. Okay. So do you like the whole fruit or are you like the juice? I mean, where I like that? all of it. I mean, so growing up as a kid, we just only had it rarely because it was expensive or if we grew it, cause I grew up in South Florida. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so we'd have it just as slices of breakfast. That was about all we did with it. But now that I'm older and, uh, we have a little wider access to pineapple recently, it's like, we're chopping on a salad. I'm putting it in the smoothies every morning. I'm making like a sherbet out of it and eat, you know, for desserts, I'm having slices of snacks. I'm having it, you know, and it's, it's everywhere. Uh, you know, wow. and, uh, obviously, like you said, it's loaded with water, with fiber, with vitamin C, with, you know, beta carotene, with bromelain, which is potent anti-inflammatory. I mean, the list goes on. So it's kind of like sweet, juicy, a little sassy, tangy. I mean, what's not to like, right? Yes. And health promoting. So yeah. Yes. So good. And that reminds me of when we went to Kauai 
um, there are these sugar loaf. We went to this sugar loaf pineapple farm and there were these white pineapples and just mm. so epic. Um, so, so good. And us as farmers actually spoke with the farmer who owned it and was like, you know, he's like a, he's ready to retire. And we were like, you know, do you need somebody to buy the farm? Because like we could live on, <laughs> on pineapple for the rest of our lives. Like, <laughs> it'd be amazing. Um, okay. So pineapple it is. Um, okay. So that brings me to my next thought here. My next question, Stefan, you, you are an amazing eater. Uh, you eat super optimally and you grew up this way. I was reading your bio. You're a fourth generation plant-based eater. Like where did this all come from? How did you even get so lucky to live from birth to now, um, knowing what you know and eating the way that you eat? Yeah, fortunately, very blessed. I agree. You know, my great grandfather, they lived in Pittsburgh. He was a German immigrant, uh, you know, and remember, there's a strong history in Germany, interestingly enough, of plant-based eating, of healthy living, especially the work of Father Kneipp, this German priest who kind of cured himself of tuberculosis with kind of cold water immersion therapies and fruits and vegetables. And they had all of these facilities and clinics around Germany where people would go to stay to reverse common diseases through food. So my great grandfather had heard about this years before. And when he was now living in Pittsburgh and having health issues, he began to eat fruits and vegetables and do a little therapeutic water fasting and exercise and moved his uh, family outside the city so they could have fresh air and all of these sort of simple, basic health premises. Uh, and uh, so my grandfather learned from that. My grandfather ended up going to the New York College of Naturopathy and uh, in New York City at the time and being trained as a naturopath and a chiropractor. And then he went on to open up Esser's Ranch, uh, which uh, was around for well over 65 years. Uh, where he supervised people, therapeutic water fasting, juice detoxes, healthy living. So I had the honor and the pleasure and blessing of living with my grandfather my whole life. My, it was a three-generation family in one home. And, uh, and then growing up at the ranch, this 10-acre mango farm in South Florida with, uh, you know, just growing up, eating fresh fruits and vegetables and exercising and playing. And uh, it was amazing, absolutely. And uh, obviously radically influenced my life and my career choices. So oh my God. how can I not experience that and want to share that message, you know, with the rest of my life uh, oh with people? God. That is super incredible and amazing. And not that I can mold my son to be anybody other than himself, but I truly hope that he grows up to be a plant pusher in the best way, <laughs> in the <laughs> very right. best way and educating people. Um, he listens to all my podcasts and he's like, welcome to the urban pharmacy podcast. Like, and he, he knows all the doctors, like he knows you. It's amazing. Okay. So, I love it. uh, wow. That's just incredible. And you send the best message. You are such a bright light and you are a professional in so many ways. Just tell us quickly what you do on a daily basis, aside from these juice retreats that I know you do, can you touch on that too? Uh, well, right now I'm very blessed to have a lot of exciting things that I get to be part of. Uh, you know, the last six years, uh, well, actually the last 10 years, I've been private practice here in uh, Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, uh, working with non-operative orthopedics. So doing a lot of sports medicine along with lifestyle medicine. So I do cool stuff like stem cells and platelet-rich plasma injections and standard musculoskeletal evaluations. But I incorporate lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition into that. Uh, I do healthy living talks around this city and nationally, uh, as well as a lot of stuff online, as you suggested. Now, in addition to that, I'm a team physician for the University of North Florida, all the varsity athletics, which is a D1 school. And then I teach residents. So I have medical residents and sports fellows every day, doctors in training with me, uh, with my goal to transform their lives. So they go out and transform more people's lives. So teach them about plant-based nutrition, about motivational interviewing, incorporating it into their practice. Uh, so I get to do all those fun things. And then in addition, we host, my wife and I, a juice bungalow here in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, a couple minutes from the beach. Uh, where people can come and stay, get away from the world, you know, get away from the toxicity and the craziness, get fresh squeezed organic juice every three hours, a lot of fresh, clean water, sleep, massages, uh, and uh, really just rejuvenate, let their body do what it's meant to do, which is to heal. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm richly blessed. And it's so much fun to be part of people's health journey uh, on every level and in different places. And I just 
I'm so excited to be alive and, and to be able to be part of people's lives in a good way, hopefully. Oh my gosh, you're making such an amazing impact. It's seriously so inspirational. Okay, so living in the world that we're living in right now, um, we're sicker than ever. And we are in September as of right now, go September 2021, going into the next flu season, um, which is probably going to be a doozy. So I want to ask you, Stefan, like where, where can we start in this day and age? What are some of your top tips to get going on boosting our immune systems? Um, which I mean, we could probably go on for literal hours on, but like, what are the top foundational things that you see with your patients and with the people that you touch on a daily basis that we can change now that are going to make the biggest impact for our health? Great question. I'd say there are probably six major ones to think about, but the reality is every person has to decide which one they're willing to start with. It's kind of like when people say to me, what's the best exercise for me, Dr. Esser? I say, what are you willing to do? And then we start there. And so when I think about it, I think about the basic premises of health, those pillars of health really are nutrition or food, right? Movement or exercise, sleep, emotional poise, right? Avoidance of toxins and sunlight. And if you just break it down in those six elements, and then you say, where am I willing to start? A lot of people unfortunately get sucked into shamanism and they're looking for like a quick fix or something out of a box bag, you know, out of a pill bottle, et cetera. But the reality is what you do with your fingers and forks uh, are some of the most powerful predictors of your immune health for this coming season, as well as for years to come. So certainly, you know, if I had one place to tell people to start, it would be nutrition. I think that is the bedrock of our health. But the other place I might pick out of there that some people wouldn't is actually sleep, which is so inherently essential because during sleep, our bodies recover, our bodies renew, right? Our bodies debride and get rid of garbage, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's just so crucial to remember that you need those six to 12 hours of sleep per night, depending upon where you are age-wise and how active you've been in order to recover fully and really to be the healthiest you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's break, let's break those down a little bit. Um, <sighs> nutrition, where do we start with standard American diet going to a more optimal way of eating? Where, where can people get going? Yeah. I'd say the first thing to do is to say more, more of the bright, colorful, fresh rainbow foods. Stop pitting people in the places of, I'm either part of a cult or I'm not part of a cult, right? But rather, it's the idea of, I'm going to eat more. I'm going to eat more of the good stuff, right? So sure, of course, I want everybody to go online, download my four-week detox, do it 100%, you know, clean up aggressively and move forward. But not everybody's ready for that. And I recognize that. So what I want to encourage your viewers who might not be ready for 100% jump in the cold water is to actually get more. So in other words, hey, instead of two scoops of haagen ice cream and five blueberries on top, let's go with a pint of blueberries and a tiny little bit of haagen ice cream on top. Mm-hmm. Ideally, I don't want any of the haagen I just want the nice, nice cream with uh, the bananas. But I want to start where you're willing to start. I'm going to take your hand. I want you to start walking down the path. So if you're ready, if you hear the message and you recognize the best thing for my health, the best thing for animal health, the best thing for the planet is for me to go 100% plant-based, whole food, minimally processed, SOS type food. Let's do it. Let's go. We got this. Let's run together down the path. Yeah. But if you're not there yet and you're like, oh, my food addiction is too great. My, I'm struggling emotionally, psychologically. I'm struggling with food preparation. I'm struggling with support. Well, then let's start somewhere. And so, I mean, like, you know, I pulled this over here, right? I mean, heck, take an apple, eat it. Let's start there. Let's go, Right. Every decision that you make is so powerful and people forget this. They think it's got to be this huge radical transformation, but it's every step. Grab some blueberries, eat them, put them in your mouth, eat them, and let's move forward. Mm -hmm. And every time you're doing that, you're giving information to your cells that is either turning on disease, turning it off, up-regulated inflammation, down-regulated. You are modifying your body with every bite. That's what's cool. And so my recommendation to people is start where you're willing and let's move forward and stop looking behind to where you said, oh, I can't do that. I never was able to. I'm too blank. I'm too this. I'm too that. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too sick. I'm too fat. I'm too poor. I'm too busy. I'm too. 
No, you're not. You're only those things if you say you are. And so now is the day to say, I value my health. I value me. I am worthy of health and I want to be healthy. And then let's go down that path together. Yeah. 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 I love that. And yeah, I love how you talked about, well, first off SOS free guys, it means salt, oil, sugar free. Like we've talked about this on the podcast with multiple other professionals. They're addicting. They're so addicting. So if we can just at least start cutting those out, which is, you know, they're really attached to processed foods and we really crowd out with the, the micronutrients, which I know you, you teach on so much, um, of the fruits and the vegetables, like our body is going to start craving that. And we have to send those messages. So I really like that. I like that visual of putting the entire bowl full of blueberries, just a little bit of that ice cream. If you need to get that like dopamine hit and just start, you know, decreasing it on a daily basis. Um, now, can you talk about how, what we're eating, um, animal heavy foods and processed foods just briefly, why they are contributing to a decrease in our immunity, like cellularly, what, what are these foods doing to us, depleting us? Like what, how is this happening? So I'd think about four or five different ways in which these food like substances of addiction, we might call them as well as these foods derived from animals, um, you know, have a negative effect on our body, you know? So number one, let's just start with basic inflammation. So the foods that are heavily processed and the foods derived from animals uh, upregulate inflammation in the body, whether it be due to the rapid spikes in blood sugars that occur from a result of, let's say, the processed sugars, processed flours and the like, whether it be from insulin insensitivity, meaning that your body's unable to use its insulin and blood sugar as well. Um, that would be from the high fat, high saturated fat, meat based foods, or whether it be from arachidonic acid, which is a parent molecule for prostaglandins. Let's break all that down, right? So, the idea being the following your immune system is like a well trained military that should be competent and ready to respond the moment the alarm goes off. Everybody's ready, they're running down, they're ready because the bad people are attacking, right? And they're ready to protect your body. But if you compromise your immunity, now you've got people who are sleeping on the job. You've got people who are kind of dealing with, a, you know, oh, they're in the bathroom again with their upset stomach, right? They're not ready to actually go to battle for you. They're dealing with a lot of other garbage and junk. That's a very simplistic you know, concept there. But so studies, for example, show us that increasing the consumption of refined sugar impairs the function of your neutrophils, which are your white blood cells, to burst and release hydrogen peroxide, which is what they do to engulf and break down uh, sort of bacteria and viruses. And so as a result, if you eat these high sugar foods for multiple hours afterwards, your immune system is impaired. It's unable to do its job. And so the great example of that would be the little child who comes home with a sore throat from school and the well-intentioned parent takes them to Dairy Queen to have a cold something to eat on the back of their throat. And without realizing it impairs the immunity of the child further. So the disease process progresses more rapidly. So compare that to, for example, how I was raised where you started getting a little bit of a sore throat. It was merely, okay, we're shutting you down. You're sleeping, you're drinking water and that's it. Yeah. It's like, wow. And so the studies show us, for example, on therapeutic fasting, that after a couple hours of fasting, immediately neutrophil function increases and enhances. In addition, lymphocytes, right, which are these T cells in your body that are about fighting viruses, et cetera, they immediately what we call demarginate, meaning they come off the periphery of your blood vessels and they come out of your bone marrow in search of the bad guys. And so that's what occurs. So when you put your body into that state of brief therapeutic fasting, immediately you upregulate the immune system. Let's not forget too that the consumption of food, especially calorie dense, micronutrient poor foods is a lot of work on the body. People get in this bad habit of thinking of just calories in. They never are thinking about, well, how many calories does this take to break this down, right? What's the trade-off here? Mm -hmm. So foods that are heavily processed, foods that are all the meats and the dairy, et cetera, these foods are heavy on the body. They take a lot of work at the level of the kidneys, at the level of the liver to break down, especially the animal-based foods. Uh, you know, the refined foods, they're more rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream, but they have a lot of negative effects because they act almost in a drug-like fashion uh, with impairing immunity. So the second thing I said was inflammation. 
And so all the studies are clear on this is that when we consume more animal-based foods, they increase inflammation at the cellular level and they do nothing to reduce inflammation. Again, the risk benefit relationship versus fruits and vegetables, right? You cut that apple, it turns brown. Why? Because it's oxidizing. It is absorbing inflammation. So when you eat that live fresh food, you are absorbing your own inflammation in the body. Now I mentioned do big words, arachidonic acid and prostaglandins. Well, everybody in America just about knows about this, but they don't know about it. They know about it because arachidonic acid is a parent molecule that's broken down to form prostaglandins. And prostaglandins are molecules that go in your bloodstream and damage your tissues. They cause pain. So a woman's period, why? Well, because prostaglandins are pissing off her uterus. You know, people have osteoarthritis in the joints. Why? Prostaglandins in that level. And so when you take an ibuprofen, most and leave naproxen that's blocking the conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandins. You're blocking that chemical pathway. But do you know the number one source of arachidonic acid in the human diet is all meat and dairy and fried foods. It's not broccoli. It's not blueberries, right? They don't have that. And so uh, the reality is if you're consuming lots of meat-based foods, you're increasing the production of arachidonic acid in your body. And as a result, you're increasing the likelihood of prostaglandin production and pain. So that's why people find when they consume more bright, colorful, fresh fruits and vegetables, on average, their joint pain decreases, as well as sinus inflammation and chronic, chronic congestion, all of which are part of immune function. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Fascinating. All right. So plants win. Now let's talk about micronutrients, because um, you mentioned that briefly. Um, I know that you eat largely raw. Um, can we just talk really quickly about, uh, optimizing our micronutrient absorption? Are you looking at, you know, whole raw plant foods, fruits and veggies, or are we thinking about juicing? Do you ever think about like eating the cruciferous vegetables raw versus cooked uh, for maximum micronutrient absorption? Like, do you have a rule that you follow or is it really just like largely for the people that are listening? Like, let's just get them in. Yeah. You know, I'm a simple guy. I've got life to live. You know what I mean? I don't have time to sit around and count exactly what percentage of that and percentage of that. And what a, so if you like doing that to, you know, I say to people, you want to do that, knock yourselves out. Yeah. But the reality is if you are eating large quantities of minimally processed whole plant-based foods, and that's all you're eating, especially, right? So long as you're getting adequate total caloric intake, I don't think you need to be worried about the rest. Stop worrying about all the other little details. So a lot of people, unfortunately, they go, they start looking at the forest and they get focused on the trees too quickly, right? So I think the key is first, eat, if you're serious about this, eat nothing but plant-based foods, whole minimally processed, et cetera. You cook them a little bit, don't cook them a little bit, 80% raw, right? 20% cooked, ideally in my mind. Uh, but other than that, eat for what your caloric needs are with a micronutrient density that's appropriate for general health and then see where you are in six months. Okay. And in six months after that, make another evaluation, right? So, you know, there might be times in your life where you're going, ooh, I'm falling away from the greens. I'm not getting enough greens. Let's get more greens in, right? Mm -hmm. So on and so forth. But I think the key first place, because what I don't want people to do is start being like, oh, wait, there's this detail and that, and I have to be careful the percentage of that and how many cooked, yeah. you know, and it's like, they, all of a sudden they get overwhelmed. They're like, I may as well just go eat, you know, McDonald's, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, right? Because I see that all the time with people back in the old days, right? When I was growing up, it was all the food combining stuff, right? Yeah. Can't have acid with alkaline, can't have this with that. And before you knew it, people were like, this is too much work, I'm out. Yeah. And so we don't, I don't want people to be like, oh, what, I, Am I getting enough omega-3s here? Am I getting enough this here? What about my thiocyanate that? What about this? Right. And it's like, oh my gosh, right? So for the higher level people, absolutely. You've been doing this for two, three, five years. Well, now let's get a little bit more into the bushes, into the details of yeah. all this stuff. But yeah. at the heart of it, we want you just loading up your body with micronutrient dense foods, you know, in huge quantities and, uh, and move forward from there with as little kind of processed added junk as possible. Yeah. Okay. So good. I'm really glad you said that because people do get so caught up in the, the, they overanalyze the, the little things where the, and then just lose the entire sight of like the bird's eye view of healthful living, um, healthful eating, at least, um, I know right. that the eating is so, you know, touchy, 
Um, and omega threes, you guys can even be found in like iceberg lettuce. So we don't, I mean, they're everywhere. We just need to eat, you know, we'd have to eat like 50 heads of it, but still, I mean, we're stressing out too much on, on the little things. Hey friend, before we get too far into this episode, I want to be sure you know about how the environment plays a role on your overall health. For over a decade, I've been learning so much about the lack of health regulation in the personal care and food industries, and that's actually one of the reasons why I started this show. You deserve to know how to protect you and your family from unwanted body burden, and I share further information about how to make better choices and vote with your dollar in our private Facebook community called The Urban Pharmacy. On that note, I want to let you know about one of the easiest ways that we've switched to safer, and that's through my favorite clean beauty brand called Beauty Counter. Your skin is your largest organ, and what you put on it every day matters a lot. And with a low carbon footprint, cruelty-free formulations, and high-performing results, I haven't found a better beauty brand than Beauty Counter in over five years of working with this mission-driven brand. To learn more and shop clean, head to mybetterbeauty.com. Okay. So let's go to the next pillar. You said sleep. I mean, six to 12 hours, depending on how, um, you know, much how, or how old we are, et cetera, how active all the things, um, anything else that you suggest in terms of really maximizing that sleep, how to, I mean, do you suggest stopping eating early for our circadian rhythm? Like how do we maximize sleep? I think the first thing is to be aware. And very few of us are aware of our sleep. We just go, oh, I guess I'm going to lay down now. I'm kind of tired, you know. And we don't plan our sleep. We don't think about our sleep. We don't evaluate how we feel in the morning, except for that morning. We go, oh, I feel horrible. Oh. Right? What it should be is you wake up and you say, how am I feeling? Did that, was that enough sleep for me? Did I wake rested? Was that okay? No, it wasn't. Okay, do I need a nap? Yes, no. Okay, do I need to get to bed earlier? What did I do that didn't work out well? So sitting there and watching, you know, thrones on Netflix until 2 a.m. in the morning, et cetera. Not a good choice. That is not prioritizing your health. Just like if you went to Mickey D's is not prioritizing your health. So it's crucial to remember sleep is absolutely essential for your health. And so the first thing is awareness. If you're waking up and you're downing some sort of caffeinated beverage to get you started, that's a problem. You may have not got enough sleep. Do it once here or there, fine. But if you're waking up and having to drink multiple glasses of something, it's no bueno. That's not good. We don't want that. So what I recommend is first awareness of your sleep. And if you notice that you're not that energetic, vivacious self and you're dragging, okay, well, maybe you need to get a little more sleep. Now go back to sleep hygiene, right? Which says, you know, the bedroom is for sleep and sex only, not for watching movie and reading books, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we get into the bed, you know, within 30, 40 minutes prior to bedtime. We don't want, you know, no caffeine, excuse me, after like 2 p.m., no exercise after like 6 p.m. or within three hours of sleep, no eating within two hours of sleep, you know, all these little basic, very simple premises that make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we should be prioritizing our sleep. So if you're that person who can do anything, anything, watch the horror film, do whatever and lay down and you're out and you're, you know, sleep for eight, 10 hours, you wake up rested, knock it out. That's great. But if you're the person who tends to have a little reflux or a little sensitivity or that, you know, you're up all night fidgeting, you need to be serious about your sleep hygiene and your sleep habits. And if those things are inadequate, you know, again, looking, did you get some sunlight on your body during the day? Did you get the exercise? All these things increase sleep depth and performance. Uh, you know, the next thing is to think about, do you need some supplementation? Do you need a little bit of magnesium? Do you need a little bit of, uh, you know, some, you know, let's say a little lavender oil or things of that nature. Um, these are all things to consider, but the first place to start, be aware and then sleep hygiene. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And now I'm trying not to be an overanalyzer here of magnesium, but Dr. Esther, Esther, if there is a specific form of magnesium, do you, is there a specific form that you recommend for people who are looking to relax, um, to go to bed? Well, I tend to like magnesium glycinate, but again, is if there's something that you love, please share with us as well. Um, I'm still deciding. I'm okay. still deciding, <laughs> kind of testing on myself because I know there's like four main ones um, that you know you can take, and I'm creating a blog post on that right now. So I'm just trying to figure cool. out what's the best. It's kind of hard to find um, 
solid information on that. So that's right, right. It's more about uh, stories and anecdotes, I think. But historically, for my patients, I tend to use some magnesium glycinate, which is a chelated form of magnesium, and uh, you know, uh, to help them assist with sleep. Uh, but again, the other one that I like, as I mentioned, is Silexan, which is a lavender oil derived out of Germany. Uh, but again, even starting with some simple lavender oils, high quality essential oils right on the temples and hands and little things like that. But again, to me, that's next level. That's not yeah, start yeah. there. Yeah. That's next level. First, excellent sleep hygiene. Then if you need something, right? Because all of us also don't forget stress plays a huge part in our ability to sleep. And so if you're up ruminating about life and things and the environment and the world and this and your job and your spouse and your, oh my goodness, right? So you've got to make sure, you know, sometimes you might need a little assistance with sleep. Is that going to be some spiritual reading? Is that going to be deep breathing and meditation? You know, what is it? Uh, but we need to all make sure that we're maximizing those lifestyle interventions before going to agents, you know, that are supplements or pharmacologic agents, et cetera. Yeah, I love that. And guys, if, if you don't have like a good quality lavender essential oil um, and you for some reason don't want to have it in your home for whatever reason, um, you can grab little lavender sachets. I know you would think to put these in like your, your drawer. If you're watching YouTube, you see me holding up a lavender sachet, but um, you can smell it and still get some really great therapeutic effects um, to calming your nervous system. And, you know, sniff it before you go to bed. So, okay. I love that. Lavender is ridiculously awesome. Um, okay. What was your next pillar? What was another pillar for uh, move, movement or exercise? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the data on exercise is so compelling for the immune system. It increases neutrophil or white blood cell activity, right? Neutrophils and lymphocytes. Uh, you know, it increases blood flow. In other words, it's opening up the blood vessels so that the white blood cells can get to where the infections are better. It dilates all of your capillary beds because people don't recognize and they forget this. You know, if, you, if your roads are all shut down from a massive hurricane, the military can't get in there to fight the bad guys. So you've got to open back up the blood vessels. Well, nutrition, those nitric oxide rich foods, the nitrate rich foods, right? The, the beets and the berries and the greens, right? They dilate the blood vessels. So once the blood vessels are open, now you need to get the military through. And when you exercise, you increase short term, right? Your cardiovascular output, your heart rate, et cetera. And so everybody's out to the periphery. They're yeah. getting into the mucosa better. They're getting to the brain and the skin and the tissues. And so we want the immune system to be getting there well and effectively. So exercise is so powerful for improving blood flow, mobilizing your white blood cells, also mobilizing mucus. Remember, your body forms mucus to engulf bacteria and viruses in your lungs and your nose, et cetera. So when you're exercising, your lungs are going, ooh, ooh, right? And that's getting all of the blood flow in there. And it's mobilizing the mucus so you can cough it up, get it out, snort it out, whatever with all of the bacteria and viruses that might be in it. Uh, but so all of this is so essential. Oxygen, of course, don't forget, is toxic to viruses. They hate it. And bacteria hate oxygen. So that's why that respirations, big respirations that come with exercise are so powerful to reduce mm -hmm. your risk of upper respiratory illness. And so we want to be getting that strength training exercise, but also cardiovascular on a regular basis, ideally 150 to 300 minutes a week of some form of cardiovascular activity, even if that's just jogging in place for 10 minutes, right? While you're waiting for your oatmeal to be fully done, yeah. right? Or going out and biking and cycling and swimming and all the rest. But the reality is movement is medicine. So you want to get a little bit in every day throughout your day, where and when possible. You have to artificially create movement in our society, right? Because everything is so industrialized and controlled. So if you don't, you know, if you're not out there working a physical job, you've got to intentionally get up from your desk, do, you know, quick 20 squats, do a quick 20 push-ups off your desk, stretch out side to side, jog in place for a minute and a half, and then you're back to work. Yep. Right. Yep. But even that is powerful medicine. And so every day in every way, each of us needs to be moving. Yeah. Yeah. And that just brings, you know, me to the point of why we should buy the pineapple farm in Kauai so that we can, uh, <laughs> you know, be out there planting and, um, you know, moving on a daily basis. I like it. Having, I like it. <laughs> just another, you know, just another reiteration there. Okay. So we have three more pillars. Um, what was it with poise that you said? 
That's right. Emotional poise. Right? Emotional so, poise. Yeah, this is a classic stress reduction concept, right? So, but being emotionally poised, in other words, when that crazy stuff happens to you, which is going to happen every day, something, right? It's going to stress you out a little bit. The guy cut you off in traffic. The person at work was blank. You know, your grandma called you and talked about whatever. I mean, who knows? But something is going to happen that's going to cause, quote, emotional stress. Mm-hmm. You and I need to be at that place that we're emotionally poised. Right. You know, kind of we're able to rock a moment and then come right back, not suddenly fall off the pillar, go crazy. Right. And immediately we're going hunting junk food out of the closet in the pantry. And then we're, you know, blah, 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 I can't handle this. You know, life is just, Mm -hmm. and we all know how that works. Right. It's this out of control spiral. So it's important to think about can you come back? I've suddenly had a visual in my head of remember those little blow up toys that, you know, you used to see in the stores that would be, you'd hit it and it would kind of pop right back up. Mm -hmm. Right. Our our emotional poise should be such that we have a nice foundation. That's robust that even when we go, well, we come right back here. We're okay. It's all right. You know, versus kind of splat on the floor and, you know, water everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so you want to develop this because many people think this is something you're born with or otherwise. The reality is your response to emotional challenges and stressors is in your control. And it's a habitual response. And you can change the neural network. But first, you have to be aware of your response. For me, for example, when I'm in a stressful situation, all of a sudden, my heart rate starts going up. And I start taking more shallow breaths. And I just feel not well. And I'm like, what the heck are you doing? This is not helping anything. So I'm trying to get in my mind into the place where I can say, hey, you don't have to act like you're a five-year-old boy who's in trouble. Take a breath. Evaluate. Did you do something wrong? Yes or no. Now, breathe again evaluate the situation in more of a rational response, right? Or if I'm having conflict in my marriage or with my children or with outside people, wait a second, what are my real goals in this moment, right? Pause, be present, breathe deeply, and then come back. So whatever it takes for you to start being more aware. And then I think there's value. Some of us really need some more intentional work. And that might be something like a cognitive behavioral therapy workbook, right? There's some great ones on Amazon that you can get for, you know, seven week cognitive behavioral therapy workbooks. I encourage people to get them, use them for that seven week period. See if it's assisting you, see if it helps you, right? For many of us having a foundation and a spiritual religious belief system is very powerful innately to believe in a higher power, right? That you have greater value and purpose in life, et cetera. Each of us need to find that grounding place in which we can come from to then find balance, to find Mm -hmm. poise. So absolutely essential because otherwise, you know, you're kind of just like a leaf being blown around constantly, right? With the emotion this way and the emotion that way. And oh my goodness, and this has happened in the world. And it's like, whoa, stop, stop, come back. I was thinking about it before our talk. I'm not sure why it was coming in my head, but you know, in the old days, right? You used to have these films on television And most of what you watched on average was well-balanced families, happy people talking, blah, blah, blah. And and they said, oh, well, that's not reality. And it was interesting because actually for a lot of people, it was reality. And now we're watching the Kardashians, right, on TV and all this. And it's like, now we're saying, well, that's reality. And people are almost modeling their lives off of what they see. And so what you and I need to stop and we need to say, wait, how do I want to model my life? Do I want a dysfunctional family unit? Do I want a dysfunctional life? Do I want a dysfunctional job situation, right? People watch The Office, right? And et cetera. Well, are they modeling that in their workspace, right? Right. So even though the humor is evident and apparent, the reality is, well, that's not what we should try to create. We should actually be trying to create cohesive relationships, positive things, encounters that engage, uplift, and empathetically support. But all too often, I think we've now grown up in a populace, or people have more recently, in which that's normalized behavior, and now they put it into their own lives. So I tell people, be very careful what you put in here, because it reacts, it radically influences how you live your life. So actually, for me, there's no television in my house. We've got computers, yeah, we've got computers, but are very careful with what we put in you know, that goes into our brains because I know for me, I'm very easily influenced. So if I watch that, oh my gosh, I get all worked up and done instead of if I watch uplifting positive things, if I'm out in nature, if I'm goal oriented, right? Um, I'm far more likely to be in a positive headspace. So 
Again, what did I say earlier about food? Same thing with exercise, awareness. Mm -hmm. It's so easy for many of your viewers, for all of us, you know, what happens is you're in the midst of life and it's chaotic and it's crazy and you feel overwhelmed and then you're just reactionary. Instead of flying to the 30,000 foot view of your life, looking down and saying, how's it doing? No, that's not, well, that's not working out well. That's not going to set you up for success, Brenda. You know, I, I need to change that. Hmm. All right. Well, Paula, whoa, I didn't realize that was happening. Okay. I need to change that, but we've got to get to that place. So maybe that's getting away from your life for a day or two somewhere, but not going just to kind of luxuriate and sit watching TV. No, to actually be thinking. How am I doing nutritionally? How am I doing exercise-wise? How am I doing sleep-wise? How am I doing emotionally? And actually developing a plan for your health. So maybe that's maybe that's coming to Esther's Ranch Juice Bungalow. It's funny. We actually have a curriculum for people while they're with us, which is doing that, breaking down their life a little bit and saying, I need to create a coherent plan for my health. Yes. You know? So it's not just this out of control moment constantly. I've got to get things in a place where they are leading in a direction that I actually want them to go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. And uh, bringing it back to the TV, we still have our t- TVs. I do turn it on every now and then, but guess what it is? It's only for a little house on the prairie. And that oh, is, I love that it. brings me back to what you were yeah. just saying, like the family, you know, like it, that cohesiveness. I want my son to learn that. So if right. we're going to turn the TV on, we're watching little house on the prairie. I love it. Oh, absolutely. As you should, you, sh- you should be indoctrinating him with healthy behaviors and healthy yeah. foundations as yeah. much as possible. I love it. I and love we need it. to think about that environment, which I know that you are so, um, that you teach so much about too, like the news, like we're talking about immune health on this episode right now, guys, like mm-hmm. the news that we're watching, the fear that's mm-hmm. always in us, we're living that reactionary state. We're not able to be proactive in our health when we're always right. having that fed into us subconsciously, even if you're cleaning your house and the news is on and you think that you're not like watching it, it is going in and it is not serving your immune system. It is depleting your health and we need to unplug and go to Dr. Esther's range. Yeah. I mean, and that stuff breaks my heart. Like you were just commenting on the news and all the COVID stuff, because the reality is right for 90 plus percent of people in our society today, uh, it is a non-entity. It is not event. And, you know, and yet the, the, the hype, the media, et cetera, that is just creating panic and fear and anxiety for people and has continued. And as you suggested, that suppresses immune function and it paralyzes people to even make healthy decisions. And makes people begin to think that what they do doesn't matter, which is absolutely unscientific. Uh, Because as you may have seen, right, is that when you look, you know, eating this plant-based approach, getting regular exercise radically reduces statistically your risk of the common diseases like heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, but also of uncommon diseases like the flu, H1N1 and COVID-19. The data is compelling on that, showing that 74% reduction in severe COVID-19 in people who are fully plant-based. Uh, I mean, it's just the, the data is all there to support us. And it's crucial that we recognize that what people say in the media is not always the truth and not um, always accurate. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Okay. So as we're talking about viruses. Um, I want to ask you this. Can you please tell us about, as we're going into the flu season, what you think about the flu shot? So number one, I tell everybody they should make an informed decision based on risk benefit for themselves about whether to get any vaccination of any kind, right? That's a very personal decision. And I think you should make that decision. We should all have the right and freedom to make that decision. Number two, Uh, As far as for myself, my decision with regards to the flu shot has been and will continue to be that I will not be vaccinated for a disease process that I have extremely low risk of. Mm -hmm. So the flu for me is going to be a non-event. Me getting vaccinated will not reduce my risk of spreading it to anyone else. Thus, there is zero benefit to me and all risk. So you want to remember all medications, all interventions, all nutritional interventions as well have risk benefit relationships. So when you get vaccinated for the flu, you are essentially saying the risk of the flu is higher for me than the, or for the, forgive me, the benefit of the injection is higher than the risk. So for me, as a mid 40 year old, you know, slender plant-based eater, exerciser guy who gets sleep, my risk of the flu being a significant event is minimal to none, right? Less than probably 2%, 1%, Mm -hmm. number one. So from a scientific statistical perspective, no benefit to me. Then I take on all the risk, 
So you want to remember that anytime you get a vaccination, it comes with a specific risk. So for example, you get a vaccination for the flu, it can increase your autoimmune responses, right? Your allergic responses, because you're putting a chemical into your body, the body responds to it in a way that says, well, this is not normal. Let me create an immune response and then attack it. But every time that occurs, it can also begin to attack your body incorrectly. So for example, when I worked at Harvard doing my residency, every flu season, we'd see kids coming in with increased rates of Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre is an autoimmune disease in which the body attacks its own nervous system and the child begins to get an ascending paralysis, an inability to walk, difficulty breathing, and they get put on a ventilator. Every year we would have kids with that. Some would completely recover, others would not. The rest of their life, they'd be disabled because they got a flu shot. What the heck? Why are we vaccinating kids when the risk is almost nil to those children? Mm -hmm. So this is a problem. We need to look at the science and the actual data. So the Cochrane meta-analysis, which is a group that does evaluations of medical interventions, says that for the average free-living American, and really in the Western world, the risk and the benefit of the flu vaccine is such that most people do not need it and shouldn't get it. If you are over the age of 65, or if you live in a group home, like a nursing home or nursing facility, there may be some benefit, according to Cochrane Net Analysis. But this is the most standard of care, straightforward. That is their international recommendation based on the science that exists. Mm -hmm. So for the average person who's a 45-year-old, 32-year-old, 28-year-old, whatever, walking around outside, otherwise healthy, there's not a huge benefit. Don't forget the following too. The flu vaccine is based upon what were the strains last year or right. the year before. It is not based on what's around now. And so depending upon the year, if you look at CDC data, the flu vaccine can be anywhere from 30 to 70% effective, meaning it's not even that effective. So for you to get the flu vaccine, not get benefit, just get risk makes zero sense. So for me, I'm out, I'm not in. And I would tell people to make their own informed decisions uh, based upon their personal risk. Yeah. Yes. And I remember uh, learning that in physiology too, about like all the flu strains and how it's just like, you can't ever know the, you know, the year in which what strain it's going to be. And it's just based on past. And it's like a literal needle in a, in a haystack. So it's just kind of like, that's wow. right. I mean, I think, and again, that's the same thing, what we're seeing, like the COVID vaccine for kids, right? So in 2020 to 2021, only 385 children died of COVID, you know, and, uh, and of those, those were all seriously ill kids with major medical problems, et cetera, on average. So that's out of 50 million children in America, 385 died supposedly of COVID. Mm -hmm. So the risk benefit relationship certainly does not fall in favor of vaccinating children for COVID. There is no scientific data to support that. And that is clearly kind of what even the international organizations would say as well. So uh, as far as kind of for adults, again, people need to make their own informed decision based upon their risk benefit relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you for that. All right. We have two more pillars, right? Have we touched That's on right. all of them? That, okay. There are two more. Yeah. The next one was sunlight. And so sunlight is so rejuvenating for multiple reasons. Number one, obviously, sunlight increases the production of vitamin D, which, as you know, is a potent antiviral immune regulator and so good for so many other things like depression and the rest. So we want that. Number two is that sunlight in our eyes helps to reset our circadian rhythms to help us to sleep when it is dark, when dusk comes on. So sunlight is crucial for those two major reasons uh, you know, for us. And so you want to be able to get out there, ideally 15 to 20 minutes worth of sunlight on your arms, legs, back, and when the sun is above 45 degrees of the horizon, so you can create some vitamin D, right? We're not asking you to be out there and bake and burn and get all the skin cancers, but rather be out there 15, 20 minutes, get some good sun exposure in the eyes, on the arms, legs, and back, and get some good vitamin D production. So crucial to have that. Yeah. 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 So, and if people can't get that, do you recommend a, like a blanket, you know, recommendation of a vitamin D supplementation? I do. I mean, first I say get tested, test don't guess, right? So get, get your vitamin D tested. Good morning. I see you there. Yeah. My son, good is morning, good morning. My son has woken oh. up. I didn't know if you'd bring your oatmeal in here or not. I love it. This is Dr. So, We're talking about hi. So I tell people, if you, I get tests first, if your vitamin D is below 40 or so, then it's probably worth repleting. If it's up there in the 50s and the 60s, uh, there's no value to you repleting with more vitamin D. Uh, so test, don't guess. So yeah. test it. And if it is low, yes, replete it. 
Uh, I think as a strict plant-based eater, you know, it's worthwhile to replete your vitamin D, whether it be 2,000 to 4,000 international units per day, and then get it retested in six months and see where you are and, uh, and see if that was adequate for absorption and for you. Yes. Okay. Love it. All right. Dr. Esther, nope. what is the last pillar for immune health? Oh, wait. Yeah. The last one. Yeah. yeah the last was, one. What is it? Last one. I was going to say avoid toxins. Yes. So in those, yes. Yeah. Those come as the obvious toxins, the excessive alcohols, the nicotines, and all the street drugs, of course, uh, but also the less talked about toxins, right? Especially, let's say, for ladies wearing large quantities of makeup and mascara and all the rest, or gentlemen and ladies kind of wearing underarm deodorants and things like that, remembering that your skin is a potent organ of detoxification, but it's also an organ of absorption. And so when you put stuff on it, it ends up getting in it. So this is everything from the baby skincare products for our young ones to our perfumes and deodorants to our facial products, to our soaps, to our hair care products. I mean, all these as much as possible, where possible, using simple, minimally processed, organic, plant-based, you know, so on and so forth, without all of the polycarbon, the blah, blah, blahs, and this, that, and the others you can't even read, um, trying to reduce that exposure. I mean, starting, you know, for example, in Florida here, right, if you're going to be wearing your kind of... Uh, topicals to avoid sun, you know, kind of, well, all the sunscreens, trying to go the zinc oxides, right, rather than with the chemical base, um, yeah. wearing long sleeves instead of kind of short sleeves after you've gotten your sun exposure, right? But if you yeah. be out there for three or four hours working in the garden or exercising, rather have on that long rash guard, right, that protects in a hat, um, and then take it all off and get your 15, 20 minutes of sun uh, rather than three or four hours, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, so essential. Do you have any brands that you're a big fan of or that you're a supporter of for, you know, products that you like? Yeah, well, I teach people. I've been working with a particular brand, but there are so many brands that I could recommend. I, I do, uh, I'm linked with and have been uh, working with Beauty Counter for over six years. They're based out of Santa Monica, California, and they basically took the European Union standards and have exceeded them for known carcinogens, hormone disruptors, allergy causing ingredients um, that we don't want to be putting on our skin. So in terms of like sunscreen, I would say definitely beauty counter, you want to be looking for a non nano zinc. I mean, we want to be looking for mineral based sunscreens, um, not chemical based sunscreens, not only are they destroying our, our bodies, but also the coral reef. And um, yeah, I would go to the environmental working group app. This is my recommendation in terms of products in your home, um, cleaning products and your personal care products. Go to the ewg.org website, or you can download a app called the Healthy Living app, and um, it will give you a rating from one to 10 on the toxin load of your body. And you want to stay at least below a three um, in terms of your personal care and what you're putting on and in your body and bring it in your home and even, even the cleaning products that you're using. So that is where I would start. I think that's a really great uh, tool. And um, we need to be thinking about this because every single time we're putting these toxins on our body, it's just depleting our immune system. That's what we're talking about here today and how to optimize that. And um, I'm really glad that you bring it up because it's so important. And you know, they're, they're also in our, in our food, pesticides, um, you know, the antibiotics that are given to the animals, like the, we have to be thinking about environmental toxins on a daily basis because we're like bombarded with them. So, right. Yeah. Um, thank you for asking. Um, okay. Dr. Esser, we're wrapping up. I have two more questions because I really want to know what does your morning routine look like? My morning routine is hop up out of bed, uh, spend a little time in prayer and reflection, do some exercises and then make uh, smoothies and oatmeal and food for all the kiddos and wife, et cetera. And uh, then quickly shave, get dressed and zip off to work. <laughs> got it, got so it. That, that's my routine right now. You're starting with gratitude, which is I think super imperative and prayer. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then I always ask all of my guests this, what does holistic living mean to you? Holistic living to me means a style of living in which, I don't know, I'm going to make my own of it, but in which everything is kind of synergistic. Everything's working together. Uh, everything is, you know, 
the thoughts, the words, the emotions, the actions, the behaviors all kind of fall in place together to create kind of a, a beautiful circle that works together um, rather than parts working against each other, one part compromising the other, right? And yeah. instead, all of them working together to create a kind of a vital, energetic, beautiful, you know, kind of healthy life yeah. and uh, without, you know, harming those around. Uh, you know, every morning I wake up and I say, you know, nobody has to die for me today, which is kind of cool. You know, no animal had to die for me today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the same way to try to live emotionally and psychologically with gentility with our other humans in the world as well, that we're living that holistic life that, you know, that's one of growth, one of health and vitality, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, giving back where we can. Love it. Synergistic living. So good. Okay, my friend, thank you so much. I literally have so many questions that I want to ask you, but this was great. I think people are going to definitely find value. And uh, I hope that you as a listener can take steps today to become more helpful. Uh, take that approach. Listen to these six tips that Dr. Esther gave us and pick one and just start today. Even if it's just eating more apples or putting more blueberries in your bowl, um, it can make a massive, massive difference or pineapple or apples and all the things. So yes, go fruit, um, go plants. Um, all right, well, be well. We will see you on the flip side and take care. I'm over here cheering you on because you just finished another episode of The Urban Pharmacy. For today's show notes, head on over to theurbanpharmacy.com and be sure to join us inside our private Facebook group called The Urban Pharmacy, where we share inspiration, live trainings, and holistic living tips to help you build community and the healthy lifestyle that you've always wanted. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button and please consider leaving us a five-star review. Before we connect again on the next show, follow me on Instagram at the urban pharmacy. That's urban with an H and pharmacy with an F. And I can't wait to hear your wellness journey as we get to know each other better. You know, there's truly no better time than now to level up your life. And I am so proud of you for showing up today. Until next time, be well, health crusader.